online on the BBC News Channel. Will he stay or will he go? Novak Djokovic's fate in Australia will soon be in the hands of a federal court. The world number one tennis player who's unvaccinated is appealing a government decision to cancel his visa. The second court hearing is underway in just a few minutes where a full bench of three judges will decide whether the defending champion stays and competes or whether he gets deported from Australia. Also on the program, in America, police are negotiating with a man who's taken hostages in a synagogue in Texas. A former Tory minister calls for Boris Johnson to resign after the controversy over Downing Street parties. And the moment a giant underwater volcano erupts, prompting tsunami warnings right across the Pacific. Good evening. A court hearing is due to begin in the next few minutes to decide whether Novak Djokovic should be allowed to remain in Australia. His visa was cancelled for a second time after the government decided the world number one tennis player who isn't vaccinated against COVID was a threat to public health. His lawyers are appealing, describing the decision as irrational. Djokovic is due to play in the Australian Open tournament on Monday. From Melbourne, here's Shama Khalil. Once again, Novak Djokovic is in detention. And once again, the world number one is challenging the cancellation of his visa. In court documents, we learned that the immigration minister, Alex Hawke, made his decision because the player's presence in Australia may foster anti-vaccination sentiment. The tennis star's legal team say the argument was invalid and irrational and that deporting him would potentially undermine support for the vaccination program. We want Melvin Djokovic to play. And while some of Djokovic's supporters gather to back him, there's been little sympathy for the tennis player. I do feel that to make a statement to the rest of the world that we are sticking by what we've been calling for the last two years, I feel as best as if Djokovic should probably set out this one. I hope that you know the government, the judges, um, hold their ground and say, no, if you don't want to get a vaccination and, you know, you don't want to follow our rules and you can't come in. His rival, Rafael Nadal, said the Grand Slam is not just about Djokovic. Australian Open is much more important than, than any player. So uh, if he's playing, finally, OK. If he's not playing, uh, Australian Open will be a great Australian Open uh, with or without him. That's, that's my point of view. Sunday's court decision is crucial for both sides. The top seed, whose chance at a 21st Grand Slam rides on it, and a government that's been hugely embarrassed by the mishandling of the saga. Novak Djokovic has been allowed out of the immigration detention hotel where he spent the night not to be on the tennis court, not to go to practice. He'll be in his lawyer's office while a court decides his fate. Uh, this is 24 hours, less than 24 hours before the Grand Slam is due to start. He's in the draw to play on Monday and we're still far away from any certainty about what will happen. But two things are for sure. One, the government, whatever the decision is, will come out of this hugely bruised by what ter has turned into a chaos politically and diplomatically. And we also know that right now, Novak Djokovic is not where he wants to be. OK, Sharma, thank you. Sharma Khalil, they're live in Melbourne. 
Lawyers for the Duke of York want to question two people as part of the civil sexual abuse case being brought by Virginia Giuffre in America. According to court documents, Prince Andrew's legal team argue Ms. Giuffre may be suffering from false memories and they want to hear from her husband and her psychologist. Yesterday, Ms. Giuffre's team asked for evidence from two people in the UK, including the Duke's former assistant. Prince Andrew denies all the allegations against him. A former Conservative minister, Tim Loughton, says Boris Johnson's position is now untenable following the controversy over gatherings at Downing Street while Covid restrictions were in place. A number of Tory backbenchers say they've been inundated with messages from angry constituents about the growing list of parties dating back to the spring of 2020. The Labour leader, Sir Keir Starmer, says it's now in the national interest for Mr Johnson to be removed from office. Our political correspondent, Ian Watson, has the latest. Boris Johnson has come under renewed pressure following Number 10's apology to Buckingham Palace over a leaving do held last year on the eve of the Duke of Edinburgh's funeral. So today the Labour leader urged Conservative MPs to force him out. Of course there's a party advantage in him going, but actually it's now in the national interest that he goes. So it's very important now that um, the Tory party does what it needs to do and gets rid of him. Usually when opposition MPs call for a Prime Minister to go, the troops rally round. But tonight, the former government minister, Tim Lawton, tweeted, I have regretfully come to the conclusion that Boris Johnson's position is now untenable, that his resignation is the only way to bring the whole unfortunate episode to an end, and I'm working with colleagues to impress that view on number 10. And the chairman of the Commons Defence Committee, Tobias Elwood, told the BBC the Prime Minister should either lead or step aside. Outside Downing Street, demonstrators against a forthcoming police bill were making their views of the Prime Minister known. Far more subtly, some of his own MPs have also been doing so. What may be worrying the Prime Minister is that some of his former supporters now want him to go. One MP, elected in 2019, told me he owed his seat to Boris Johnson. But now he says this feels terminal and he should go quickly. And another MP that I spoke to several days ago and who told me then he thought Boris Johnson could ride out this political storm got back in touch today to say he's now damaging the Conservative brand and it was a question of when, not if, he leaves number 10. No cabinet minister though has broken ranks. Inside Downing Street there's hope that the investigation by a senior civil servant may say that the Prime Minister hasn't broken Covid rules and the expected lifting of restrictions later this month could improve his MP's mood. The Conservatives snatched the seat of Morley and Outwood in Yorkshire from Labour in 2015 but now are Conservative voters here in the market for a different leader. I'm 50-50 as to whether I think he should go or not. You know, there's so many people who've lost people and then they stood there telling us to do one thing and, and doing another. I just think it's disgraceful. Some Conservative MPs are saying it's now the mood on the doorstep that could determine whether Boris Johnson is shown the door. Ian, uh, two senior Conservative figures, uh, former ministers, now questioning the Prime Minister's future. How significant is this? It is significant, uh, Clive. Tobias uh, Elwood, of course, has said that uh, the Prime Minister should either lead or step aside. Uh, Tim Lawton, I think, uh, the former children's minister, has uh, been a little less cagey in his comments, I think it's fair to say. Now, we should be very clear about this. Just because they're speaking out tonight doesn't mean to say we're close to the 54 MPs that are required to trigger a leadership contest. But I think there is some significance in a Facebook page which Tim Lawton has, has posted tonight. And what he says on that is that obfuscation, prevarication, and evasion have been the order of the day and he cannot see how the facts that were reported by Sue Gray can possibly change the terminal damage that's been done to the reputation of the Prime Minister or how there's any way back for him. Now that is significant because this inquiry by the senior civil servant Sue Gray into the allegations of the gatherings in Downing Street and other government buildings we're told is likely to report by the end of the week and several Conservative MPs are saying they're going to be waiting for that report before reaching a conclusion. He has, if you like, jumped the gun and many more, I think, are going to be following what Tim Lawton says in a matter of days. Sure. OK. Ian, many thanks. Ian wasn't there. Police in Texas are negotiating with a man who's currently holding four people hostage, including a rabbi at a synagogue in the town of Colleyville. Now, special weapons teams are on the scene and local residents are being evacuated. Our correspondent, Nomia Iqmal, is in Washington with the very latest. Uh, Nomia, what more do we know? 
Yes, Clive, there's lots of reports and information coming out, but these are the details that we have that we can tell you so far. So this started about three hours ago. The congregation's Shabbat service was underway, it was being live streamed, there were no images. But a man could be heard on that live stream and before it cut off he could be heard speaking, at times he was cursing, he was also getting very angry and demanding that his sister be released from prison. Now, police have not confirmed who he is, we, we don't have any confirmation of his identity so far, there has been lots of speculation but no confirmation yet. And the police said that they made contact with him and they also conducted operations on the block where the congregation Beth Israel is located. Uh, they also told residents to avoid the area. A White House official has also said that they are monitoring things, so this is very much an ongoing situation, Clive. Nomia, thank you for that. Nomia Iqbal, they're live in Washington. Here, the government's latest daily coronavirus figures show there were 81,713 new infections in the latest 24-hour period. That means there were 117,800 new cases on average per day in the last week. Another 287 deaths were reported. That's of people who died within 28 days of a positive test. On average, in the past week, there were 263 deaths per day. Vaccinations are continuing, but at a slower pace. On average, in the last week, 144,015 people had a booster jab, which means 63.1% of the population, aged 12 or over, have now had three doses. The authorities in Beijing have confirmed the city's first locally transmitted case of the Omicron variant of COVID-19, just weeks before hosting the Winter Olympics. The infected individual's residence and workplace have been sealed. The Games are due to start in the Chinese capital on February the 4th. Tsunami alerts have been issued after the eruption of a giant underwater volcano near the island of Tonga in the Pacific Ocean. Australia's east coast has been put on alert along with the west coast of America and Hawaii. In Japan too, there are warnings of possible waves three metres high. Here's John Donison. The violence of this underwater volcano was captured from space, triggering tsunami warnings across the Pacific. Tonga, made up of more than 170 islands, was the first to be hit. This video, which is yet to be verified, is thought to be from inside a church. 500 miles away in Fiji, they felt the force too. Widespread coastal flooding, but thankfully no casualties reported so far. The volcano erupted just north of Tonga's main island. But the shockwaves swept across the globe, with tsunami alerts stretching from Chile to Japan. The eruption was very short, but it was very explosive. So it tells us that there was enough energy released in this very short-lived blast that was able to essentially explode water, push water out of the way and create this shockwave that sent ripples literally across the globe. Even in California, many beaches were closed as a precaution. And that's more than 5,000 miles from where the volcano erupted. John Donison, BBC News. Now, with all the sport, here's Carthy and Anais Seagram at the BBC Sports Centre. Hi there, Carthy. Hi, Clive. Thank you very much. The fifth and final Ashes test is in a new venue, Hobart, but it's a rather familiar situation after an England batting collapse on day two. England were all out for 188 in their first innings, and although Australia lost three wickets at the start of their second innings, they lead England by 152 runs with play on day three, starting in a few hours' time. Our correspondent, Joe Wilson, reports. Batting. That's England's biggest problem, and it's recurring. They began this innings with miscommunication, and Rory Burns scampering for something he couldn't reach. Run out on his return to the team. Burns dismissed for naught. That's how the whole series began, you may recall. Australia's captain got rid of England's Joe Root LBW for 34. And what good could come after that? Well, Ollie Pope recalled to the team, out for a frustrating 14. Chris Wokes made 36, although Australia had earlier dropped him twice. His partnership with Sam Billings was something at least. But 188 all out seemed pitifully little. Might as well sing while you still can. 
And in the floodlit glow, England did the bowling bit well. Pope's flying catch to get rid of David Warner. A tumbling Sam Billings to dismiss Manus Labuschagne. A Markwood rocket to bruise Usman Khawaja's glove. But Australia will resume 152 ahead, which may be enough already. Joe Wilson, BBC News. It's time to pop out of the room if you don't want to know today's football results as match of the day follows soon on BBC One. An excellent curling goal from Kevin De Bruyne gave Manchester City a 1-0 win over Chelsea at the Etihad Stadium. The victory extends City's lead at the top of the Premier League table to 13 points. Newcastle and Watford drew one all. Norwich move off the bottom of the table with a 2-1 win over Everton. Wolverhampton Wanderers beat Southampton 3-1. And Aston Villa came from 2-0 down to draw with Manchester United. Tomorrow's North London derby between Spurs and Arsenal has been postponed. In the Women's Super League, Manchester United move up to third place after a 5-0 win over Birmingham City, while Manchester City beat Aston Villa 3-0. Tennis and Andy Murray's attempt to win a first ATP title for three years ended in defeat to the world number 20, Aslan Karatsev. The Sydney Classic final was Murray's first ATP final since 2019, and the three-time Grand Slam champion described it as having been a long road to get back here. Karatsev, who was a semi-finalist at last year's Australian Open, played explosive tennis, winning in straight sets to take the title. With the Commonwealth Games just six months away, England's preparations are going well, with victory in their first game of the Netball Quad Series. They beat South Africa 71 points to 47 at the Copper Box in London, while world champions New Zealand lost against the world's number one side, Australia. Wasps claimed an important victory over Toulouse in Rugby Union's European Champions Cup. Despite having Jacob Umanga sent off during the first half of the game, Wasps beat last year's champion Toulouse by 30 points to 22. It was an impressive win that means they still have a chance to claim a place in the last 16 of the competition. And you can find the rest of the day's European Rugby Union results on the BBC Sport website and you can watch the Masters Snooker semi-finals there too, Clive. Carthy, thanks for that. And that's it. You can see more on all of today's stories on the BBC News Channel. But from me and the team, have a very good night.